Oh, and a happy, I don't know, Wednesday? I should really know the day before going live. But anyway, right, let me get the comments up here. So if people have a comment, I can bring it up. Ba -ba -ba -ba. There. Get that out of there. I had me streaming on my screen while I'm streaming. It's too much. So happy Wednesday to you all, wherever you are coming from, watching from, or watching the recording. I'm sure the intro there was just riveting for you. And that's the first secret in pre presenting. Come out with a bang. <laughs> do as I say, not as I do on lives. <laughs> so we're going to talk today about uh, why I use the slides I do and why I use them in order and how I use it in the timing. This is just me going to be riffing on them. I just have my my slide deck here uh, from a the most recent gig I did. I just got back from doing... Um, couple of talks in the west coast in california one was in uh, palm desert and one was in ontario california one was uh, the fertilizer institute and uh, western waterworks was the other one and western waterworks uh, was one i've been looking forward to for almost three years because <laughs> that's when it was originally scheduled so uh, real happy to be able to do that event um, and uh, great people and great audiences in between both of them and then before that was uh, south dakota tourism got to go return engagement which doesn't happen often which is amazing shout out to my sodak people uh and then i got to speak in iowa to uh, libertyville savings bank um and that was awesome so cool i have such a cool gig so this is what i'm gonna be here today and i talk about this type of stuff in these slides and why i'm doing what I do. I'll turn off the music there. Uh, thank you to Aiden Taylor, music.com for the soundtrack, our oldest and our man in the music industry. So I'm going to talk about some slides here and, and kind of why um, I do them in the way I do. And now there's, first of all, before I get into, to, into these, there is a difference between doing a workshop, a, a, a breakout session, a training session, and a keynote. And I, I feel that a keynote for a conference is either setting the tone for the event or the day, or it is wrapping things up with a bow and kind of kicking them out the door with an oomph. Now, that doesn't mean it has to be straight motivational. It doesn't mean it has to be straight this or this or this. I'm just saying where one of the things that I have found that I I, I did, I still can do, and, and I'm sure a lot of us in the industry can do, is that we think about it's our talk, our time, and this is what we're going to do. And what we want to be able to do is look at how it fits in. Now, it, that doesn't mean necessarily you have to go and, and get a copy of every presentation that's going to be happening that day or the previous day or the next day. It's that, what's the purpose of the talk? Both on your end and on the event's end. Now, this can be an internal event. This could be a talk for, for 20 people or 2,000 people or 20,000 people. But it's the purpose of the talk. Um, itself. Now, obviously, there's certain takeaways that you, that people are expecting when they walk in the room and that things you want them to take away. And one of the things, especially if it's your potential customer base, because I think doing talks in front of your market, uh, your, whether it's your own industry or, or a, uh, one that you, you serve into, that one of the biggest mistakes you can make as, a, as potentially as a vendor or speaker there is just, you know, obviously sell and just promote unless that's what the talk is being billed as if this is a talk on the latest technology that my uh let's say technology i'm a, a reseller or something then i'm going to show you what i've got and that's when you walk into expectations with doing versus you saying you're going to do a talk on all the latest technologies that will help this business or this industry and then you come in and it's only the products you sell there's that's two different ways of, of obviously billing something and with on marketing and in our world, it's about positioning. It's about positioning yourself as an expert in your in your in your field, in your vertical, in your so when your audience has a need for your product or service, they choose you uh, practically unconditionally. That's the goal. And so it's always the the difference of how things you know will will work. And it's it's managing expectations. The number of times people go to conferences 
And when and this is, and the biggest kick is like, it's a concurrent session. So it's at the same time as other sessions at this uh, conference or trade show or wherever it is you're at. And you have to pick one over another. And then the one you go to is not, uh, it's, uh, um, it feels like false advertising. So the speaker is either really good at talking about, and I'm guilty of this too. I, I love telling stories. And the problem is I get in my own head a lot as well. And I'm on the stage. Uh, Scott, hey, what's up, Scott? Nice beanie. Thank you. Uh, Raptors 905, always supporting the G League team just up the road from us. I've always loved your keynote slides and simplicity with a story for each. I always try to remember your lesson on keeping those simple. Hope you're doing well. Thank you, Scott. And I hope you are doing well as well. And and that's the thing with the simplicity. And really, we can. I, I'm going to take Scott's comment here and and have that play off of what I'm talking about here because this is like this is my opening slide. And and you know we talk about one of the things. I have a very old, really old blog post with just like tips for speaking, just like a huge list of them. And one of them was like, it's not about you. And it's like every tenth one, it's not about you. It's not about you. It's not about you. Um, but I feel when you, when you walk on stage, it, it temporarily is because when you first walk on stage and, and for like for me going to, to talk, you know, to any audience, I always say that I'm usually not known before I get on stage or when I walk on stage, but you certainly will know who I am when I get off the stage. And, and because I know my, my, my level of recognition potentially for the, to the extent that I can at the current place where I am in my brain and in my life that not everybody, most people don't know, especially outside of the marketing industry or the social media or the tech or the digital where I, I, I certainly, you know, cut my teeth on stuff. So when I do a slide like this, it's kind of just a stark thing. It's, it's like, because I'm, what I'm doing is when I use this slide, it really helps me quickly at the beginning explain what un means. Because you hear unmarketing, you hear this, and not all of our talk titles have un in it now, and they may not have it in the future either. But this is to say, Look, at least a publisher somewhere thought what Allison and I were saying had enough merit to put it into these books. That's what it is. And, and that's so, although it's, it's, it certainly seems egotistical and arrogant and also uh, f fair, but one of the things is establishing credibility. And, and I think one of the problems is, is establishing credibility for too long. Like you get your bio and not all events read the bio, but you get to the point where it's like, look, I know, I know, I know what I'm talking about in my world of what I've dealt with. <laughs> There's a reason why I'm here, and it's also ego, 100%. Hey, <laughs> hi Heather, how are you? Thank you. Now, here's here's the thing about keynotes like this, like with 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 Heather, with with Wally, which is turning into one of our favorite companies, a Wally Computer Associates, and. It's like there's a there's a vibe to events, and, and when you get in there, uh, you meet some people like Heather, uh, who are just they're a living brand of of awesome, and it's such a cool uh, a vibe to do that. And then what happens is you just get excited together for the talk, and that's that's Heather. So Heather, and I'm I'm glad you um, enjoyed the package, <laughs> Joshy, and everything too. Um, um, and I have some, Heather, I have some cool, um, ideas actually. I'd love to talk to you about that. Um, I think we can do some stuff together, um, in the near future or down the road. And I just think, um, it would be a freaking blast. I, I just, I've been percolating some ideas over the past couple of days. So I'd love to talk. Uh, Dean says, I listened to speaker once who announced that their company banned use of slides when they did presentations. Well, I don't hundred percent agree. I was mesmerized by how it was just him telling a story with no slides. It definitely changed my approach a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And this is a topic that, um, it's talked about a lot, obviously, in my world, in my circles, in, in, in events and meeting spaces and everything else is like death to PowerPoint. The first ever article I wrote for any publication for anything was called The Power is Not the Point. The very first thing. The two articles I wrote starting out was The Power is Not the Point and What's So Small About Your Small Business. Like, <laughs> I love the hook. I always love the hook. <laughs> Sometimes it's all I write, but that I love the hook. And the point with this, with PowerPoint, keynote, slides, visuals, Prezi, it, it, it doesn't matter. None of that should even be involved in your presentation or in your formation of your presentation until you figure out what's the point of what I'm saying or doing at this specific location and date and people involved. Okay, what's the goal? And if the goal is to show my product or service in the best light, then okay, then maybe some visuals will help. But visuals aren't just showing something you're talking about. Like we sell 
um, we sell mugs. And so I'm going to do a presentation and here are the mugs. It's not necessarily just the point. And I'm going to show you what walk through my slides today, why I'm using these the way I do, but it's really important for that to understand that there is no yes slides, no slides. And like Dean's saying here, when somebody said, you, nobody can do it. Yeah, of course, because they're horrible. Usually we've been ruining PowerPoint since PowerPoint came out. We've been ruining PowerPoint since they said, Hey, how about a typewriter animation with sounds on slides? And then people did it, but it's not that it's a visual. Can you do a talk without any other visuals other than yourself? Yes. Is it hard? Immensely. Because one of the things slides do for me, and again, I'm talking for me, not anybody else, but I'm talking for me and what I do and what helps me is one of the things that helps slides help me in my talks because of my personality and my brain is it helps me keep on track. Now I can riff. I can riff all day like I'm doing right now. I have no plan going into this today, but I can riff all day. But the point of my keynote is not to hear me talk about what I want or feel like. The point of my talk is to deliver what we talked about with the client before the event usually, which is this is the, the messaging we, we were hoping for that we've seen you talk about in the past. This is what our event is about. This is the theme. This is what we're hoping for what they walk out the door with. That's what it is versus the other way. Justin says, but you're, you've also used the opportunity to pitch your books to instead ask people to support a friend when they're going through a rough time. My oh, man, I would do that a hundred days, a hundred times in a hundred days for you. You just do the right thing with people and that's subjective for people and I get it. And Justin, I'd, I'd get the world to give you a shout out any day of the week and twice on Sundays, by the way. And Heather says, Jack is awesome. Would love to connect with you. Notify me. I will for sure. Uh, what's up, Manu? Uh, saw you inbound Boston. Inbound was always, <laughs> always fun for me because it wasn't a keynote. So I get to talk about stuff. I don't usually get to talk about in my big kind of performance of a keynote. I believe it was 2015, 2016. The way you started the keynote was amazing. You just use the face when they were reading your accolades and then jump in with a joke. All the attention was there and the ice was broken. Yeah, it's a really weird f feeling um, to sit or stand at the side of a room while they're reading your bio. Because what happens is when they're reading your bio, especially if you look like me with the beard and the bun and everything else, and I'm standing, you know, up close to the speaker, which always the sound people always love, but I'm, you know, standing on their wall and people will start doing this. When they start reading the bio, they're looking for the speaker and you're standing there and they're just like this. And Scott Stratton's the president of Unmarketing. And then they're just looking at me and I'm like, now it's extra weird. Now I know because I stand on stage, everybody's looking at me. So it's just like, what are you thinking during the bio reading? And no matter what, every bio I have is too long, but it establishes credibility. And I have versions of it. We give it to an events. And my shortest one is like, here's Scott Stratton, president of unmarketing. He's going to yell a lot. And then you walk off stage, but it doesn't establish it necessarily. But there's a huge part about that. And, and, um, a friend of ours, uh, Michael Port and Michael and Amy, who run a heroic public speaking, they have a great thing. It's about how you walk out there. Like you're there for a reason. He always talks about, you know, not saying thank you for having me. And Mike's Michael's uh, line is always great. It's always like, why are you saying that? Like, what is the alternative? <laughs> of course you're happy. Like, let's just go. It doesn't mean you're coming in full steam at the start. And I actually won't do that because again, the audience doesn't know me that well. Okay. So, uh, that's so the re one of the reasons after I go, one of the reasons I start with one of two stories right now. So for, uh, this one for, um, I believe this was, uh, Western waterworks, it was, uh, leadership in the room. So now I have kind of two core stories and that's my world in storytelling. You're looking for those stories that for me, it's a very simple process. What resonates with me? And what resonates with me is what I'm currently passionate about. And I'm really passionate and Alice and I are passionate about people. And, and we always have been, especially now though, with in leadership and teams and, and that world, because it's also the only world I'm actually academically qualified to talk about. 
Like I went to school for HR. I worked in HR. I taught it. <laughs> like, and so this stuff is really getting us going. And that's always how Alice and I kind of led us. That was been our, 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 our rod to tell us where to go. And so I know the kind of the, what the points I want to get out of it. So my talk is sectioned into key. I'm going to, I'm going to, let me pull up my keynote here in a second. Let me see if I can pull it up. So my talk here is done in a way. Hey, there it is. Uh, let's see if I can uh, pick the uh, keynote. All right, let's go here. So like this is my deck. And oh, let me get this out of here first. This is my slide deck here. And everything that I have in this deck um, is really worked out in, in my brain in kind of thirds or quadrants. And why I, I, I say that, and I'll pull up my um, slides again. Why I say that is like you have so much time. And, and talks are about a lot of things, but they're also about time. So if you have a half hour versus an hour, they're going to be two different talks, potentially, yes. But 60 can be shortened around. It all depends on what you're looking at. And I do it by almost sections and stories. So I have my opening section and I have two stories that I tell right now. Um, and I have different ones I had in the past, but they all have the same underlying thread that the story isn't about me and the story is relatable to the majority of the audience. And by relatable, it just means it has to be something that we can get, we can understand. It's adult learning principles frame of reference and all these type of things that we look at is like, do they get what these people are going through in this situation? So I use you, you, you I'm, I'm fairly well known for the Joshi story with uh, the Ritz Carlton. And one of the reasons I tell that is it's just an amazing story. They do a photo shoot with a stuffed animal. I know there's lots of stories and lots of places doing that. And that story is not mine. I just tell it. And that story is one of those things that makes you say, ah, it makes you laugh. Uh, and it makes you think because what happens is I'm telling that story to warm the audience up, just like I'm telling, uh, warm the audience up with this one with the uh, president Benson one for leaders, but I'm not just warming them up. This all leads to a point and that's the whole thing about stories, right? And it's like the point is you, you, you perform it and you prove it. So it's like for storytelling for me, it's like, here's the story. How does it relate to this audience? Here's a story, relate it. Here's a story, relate it. And that's where a lot of the customization comes in, where I might have told the Joshi story hundreds of times. And Benson, I've told less. But every rep, every story, you work on the nuance. Not in my head, not like I should pause longer here, or pause longer there. It's about just feeling what the audience is doing, what's working, and trying out different things. Again, that works for me. It not necessarily works for anybody else, but it works for me. And, and, and so you tell the story because it's also, it's safe. Because I haven't gone full Stratton on the audience. I haven't un unleashed the Stratton on the audience. Because I can get revved up. And if you've seen me do a talk, you can see the momentum builds up. And that's not scripted necessarily in my head. But it's like, yes, yeah, safer story. Because I, how I know this, wisdom is simply time plus mistakes. And whenever I've come out uh, on stage, guns a and kind of just do, take being sarcastic and and it's like it's it's not cool <laughs> because they don't know me yet. I am an outsider on every level of the work, and everybody in that audience is sitting there with every other speaker they've seen in the past, not only that day but their entire career, and they're like, "What's about to happen?" And I play with that. One of the things I not all the time, but sometimes I walk out and say, "Do you want me to explain the man bun now or at the end?" Because I know people in the audience are thinking about it. Because they've said it. <laughs> I've had events and I've had people at pre-event calls when I make a joke about the man bun. They're like, yeah, I actually was thinking that. Like, I, I get it. A lot of 47-year-olds rocking a man bun on stage or even in conferences. You look around the room and I'm saying, what is not the common thing? There's nobody with beards on or everybody's got suits or really formal. Or that. I will play with that. But I won't insult them or bring them into the joke as part of the punchline with me until I've gotten comfortable or they've gotten comfortable with me and that's an important part humor can come off real wrong real fast 
And one of the reasons is you didn't build any rapport with the audience. And that's really important. You know, if the audience already knows you, it's different. If you're speaking to 100 people and they're part of your company or, they're part, or they all know you already, it's different. But also the danger is don't assume they do. Unless it's internal, unless you do know all these people, then there is a rapport building part to this. And that's why I use these stories. And one of the reasons I do it like this, because my slides are simple and they all, that is on purpose. The white background and just like the tweet, just the words, because I use PowerPoint to nail the point usually. I really use Keynote, PowerPoint. I use my slides to, to really ram home it, unless they're part of the story, which is here they are. This is a tweet. I couldn't do this without the visual. Could I do a whole talk on marketing or, or, or selling or leadership or anything else without slides? Yeah, I, if the projector busts, if the bulb goes on a projector, and those things are like 800 bucks, if the bulb goes or whatever happens, you gotta be the professional here and keep going. What information can you give that audience if your laptop goes down, if the slides go down, whatever it is? Have a story or two in your pocket, even while they're fixing or doing it. It's, it's really something that, look, learn from others' mistakes <laughs> when it hits the fan. So I use these slides like this, like with Devin. And uh, a great point here. Uh, Goswell says, I'm a visual learner and slides help me understand the point more clearly if the presenter put the, puts the right one. Exactly, and it's the right one. It's a compliment to it. So I use this story and it's got the reveal. And every time I tell it, right, I'm working on telling the story. Like in my head, I'm not saying I'm working on the story. I'm just telling it. And as I'm telling it, different things are working better or not. And through the reps, it can work really well. And so this one was really the timing of something. So for me, slides are about timing when it comes, especially humor, but also impact. But a lot of times it's my punchline for something or it's how I delay showing something until I say something and I click it, which is why I always insist on my clicker presenter being who is driving the presentation. Because one of the things you can get, especially at conferences, is the like the perfect cue system with the clicker where the, they will drive it. You cue it, the big red arrow goes, and they'll click next slide or back or whatever it is. And I understand why they, they do that. But for me, the slides are part of the timing and I can't mess with that. I mean, a second or two delay just changes everything. So cause when I'm saying something, I'm like, and that's what happened here. And boom, it comes up and they're just like, oh my God, I wasn't expecting that. And like this story here, this is just a story that we had found that resonated with us that went viral that we put into one of our books. And it just turned into something like, you know what? This story really good. Let's see how it works on stage. We have a lot of leadership stories, a lot of Twitter stories, especially because of what, you know, our background or like what will work best because now what am I trying to say? And part of this is, well, we're trying to say that everybody's the brand, right? We're trying to say that, please, if you can hear the dogs right now, please excuse them. But we're trying to say that it's the individuals that affect the brand, just like the Joshi story, just like the, the front desk clerk or the loss prevention associate and the laundry worker. What we're trying to say is like leaders, you affect the brand, but you affect the brand when you are listening and when you're interacting with that, the customer level, your own frontline level, that's what I'm trying to get out of here with this story. That's the point. There's one point really of the story other than the, the warm up, make them laugh, make them feel like what they're getting into, getting to know me. But there's a point to it is that the leaders are the brand. So I walk them through and here's the tweet. It's like, come shovel my driveway. So this Devin, uh, you know, jokingly tries to get the president of Eastern Kentucky University to come shovel his driveway because it's a snow day in Kentucky and that doesn't happen there very often, I've been told. So then he writes back and he says, it's a deal, what's your address? So in between these tweets, I'm playing the story, right? Like here, it's like he called his bluff, so I'm getting excited, but that's not manufactured. I'm not like, I'm not acting. I'm like, this is, I'm all I'm doing is repeating the emotions and trying to get back into the emotion I felt when I first saw it. And when I first saw this tweet, I'm like, oh damn, he called his bluff. And the more you get into your story in an authentic way, the more the audience can see you're, you're into it. I love speaking. I love being on stage. I truly do. It is my, I'm so fortunate. I'm so privileged and I'm so lucky that I found the, the, the thing I want to do professionally. And I feel like I was meant to do it. That's so rare. I know because I, 
you realize that you realize how many people be want to be able to you figure out what they want to do let alone be able to do it i'm really lucky with that and i'm really fortunate to be able to do this stuff so he's like he calls this bluff and now you're going to build it because if you look at this process right i'm going to walk you through the whole slides so right so you got Devin says, hey, show my driveway. He calls a bluff, and then there's photo evidence of him doing it. And you can tell that story, and there it is. But there's more in it, right? You can play in between the slides. And I'm like, so then he did, and he called his bluff, and he actually did it. Okay, so you see when you bring in the slide there, the did it, that is part of your effect of the hitting that point. Because I can bring it up all different ways. Because I can say, uh, and then he said, he called his bluff. He said, what's your address? And then he went and did it. Or you can say, well, hey, what's your address? And then he went and did it. There's different ways to bring in that laugh or delay it or bring in that point. But I'm always going for the second boom on top of it. So you can, uh, depending on how your story, but here's the thing. It's because the next slide here is he also took a picture with his mom in the driveway but I don't just show the picture. I'm talking about here. I'm like, and he did it and he called his bluff. But then what is the ultimate burn to a guy in school? What is the ultimate burn to a dude? Obviously, it's taking a picture with his mom. So very different way of bringing that slide in. So if you're using a slide as a punchline or to you know hit a laugh or hit a point, then work it. Make the, make the transition part of the boom. Because that's where I get a lot of my laughs is delaying the photo a bit and then hitting. So this story wouldn't work without the slides. And that's what I mean by it's slide dependent on these type of things, which is important to understand too. And then here is him meeting him there, which so it keeps getting better. It's like, here's the, 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 the bluff. Here's the call. Here's the photo of the done driveway. Here's him with his mom. And I play with the dog. Um, uh, you know, holding a dog. And I'm just like, because I pause again because I noticed this too. And I'm just like, why are you holding the dog that way? You know, because, <laughs> and the audience is thinking it. So when you, you have a double chance here, you see the audience, you get the laugh, ha ha ha, it's with his mom. And then what happens in the audience is, is a lot of people are like, also look at the dog or like, oh, the dog. And I know the audience that some people are doing it. I can see them doing it. And then I dress it. So I pause for a second describe the picture for a second and then people are like what the dog what the dog and then I call the dog so everybody's like I was thinking that right so you're almost acknowledging what is already happening in the room with it but not all at once because you could do this part and he, he took a picture with his mom holding the dog inappropriately I'm still saying the thing and the point and then showing the picture and getting the laugh but there's two parts to this picture with his mom and then how his mom's holding the dog it's just a boom boom it's really nice. I really think when people laugh, not only is it wonderful for them and in releasing of all whatever's going on in your brain, and but it's also when you laugh, I really believe you listen. Sometimes you're listening, listening for the next laugh, but you're listening and you're engaged. And that's what I want. That's what I hope for the audience. Isn't necessarily the laugh, although the laugh as a speaker is intoxicating. If they're laughing, I think they're listening. And that allows me to really to hit home the points I want. So we show this one, and then the final one is like the piece de resistance. The final thing is not even this. It's when he says, I will literally never complain about going to class again. Now, when I show this as a final thing, this was kind of like my final like bow on the story. I just thought it was a nice bow. What I didn't realize is people would think this is actually really funny and a great way to close it. Because obviously it's funny, but it's like I didn't think it would get the reaction it does, and it literally gets like the best kind of cathartic ending. <laughs> Boom. It's a really nice ending, but I could have ended it here. But like we can keep, we the story can keep going. Now it depends on time because now we're back to the time factor. This, my intro, my opening, and the story, depending on how I can go, I can go 10 to 15 minutes, but I can do it in five. That's the thing. One of the skills of, of, I think, of professionally speaking, or you, you want it to be, is the ability to accordion stories. You pick one, and a lot of people in, our, in, in, in my industry call them signature stories. But can you accordion that? Can you do it anywhere from five minutes to, to 10 or 15? Because every minute of that story that goes longer, you're taking away from the rest of your time. And that's one of my biggest problems. Uh, but also... 
I'm not necessarily trying to fix it a lot because when I go off on tangents on certain topics, I'm, I'm kind of running with the audience. So if I think their audience is resonating with certain parts of what I'm doing and I didn't go on a run, then I go on a run in my brain. And that run is just like, it's unplanned, but it's passion. But I have to be very aware of that because, well, that time is being taken away from another part. And I do have certain things that we talked about with the client before the event that I really need to get to because I told them we'd do it. And I don't want to do that false advertising for a keynote like it can happen, especially in concurrent sessions. And it says, curiosity, did you do any stand-up comedy class? Um, I have not. Um, I love comedians. I love watching comedians. I love studying them. I have some friends that are comedians and I respect that profession incredibly and I could never do it I, and I don't want to that is incredibly hard um, my bar for being funny as a business keynote speaker compared to the bar for being funny as a comedian they're not even in the same universe like nobody's really sitting down at my talk at 8 a.m. in Phoenix at the Marriott saying, make me laugh. <laughs> it's just not the way it is. I don't get heckled. People don't usually walk out of my dogs. Right. So it's like, it's a different bar. Um, but no, I have not. Um, but I, I incredibly respect. No, that's what I mean. I don't No, I never did one as a student at all. I never took improv or comedy, um, classes. I've just been, I've just been talking <laughs> for a long time. No, it's just my, it's just what I've been doing for the, for the most of the time. So, okay, let's keep going through these slides here for you. So that's the point of, the, of those things, because what happens is the entire point of that story, the entire point of either the Joshi story or the President Benson story is not the story. They both are stories that are feel good, that are funny, and get to a point, but the point is this. The point I'm trying to make in the audience is to get them to this slide. This is what I want them to hear. What I want the audience to hear, and most of the time what the client wants their audience to hear, is that everything they do matters. Everything they do has an effect. And that they are their, the brand. Because I feel like if you don't matter, if you don't feel like you contribute to an over a big picture of a company or a product or a service, you don't care about your job as much. And then I say the line, um, this should be up at all your workplaces. And then I say, maybe not this, it's kind of creepy. Again, trying to address what's being looked at or said in the room. Like I do the contrast on purpose. There's the black in the background is on purpose, contrasting this. Right, that's the pull point. I'm contrasting, so I'm using a white background for everything except this. That's my point. I'm really trying to hammer something, and then we get to here. Now there's segues, right? So there's segues between sections and stories, and what I'm trying to do here is go from telling them that they're the brand, their people are the brand, and they're in this together kind of thing to segueing towards another point that I get asked to bring up a lot and I'm passionate about is the bias towards generations. And, and, and it's, I've been doing this pre COVID kind of like people who rip on millennials and stuff. And now it's Gen Z or Gen Z. And so there's a segue here and the segue slide for me is this. Well, it's actually this because this is also my domain but I can work you're the brand into you're the brand on every channel. And then I bring this up, but also there's too many channels. Yes. And what I want to do is relate to the audience again. And I show this first because it's a graphic I got a long time ago, but also it's kind of dated. <laughs> so then I make a joke because I know people in the audience who know digital and stuff. They're like, Whoa, there's a lot of old stuff on there. I'm like, Oh, hang on a second. I, I have an updated one. And I just throw that on there kind of as a joke, but I also like the graphic because it's just the clutter, the overwhelmingness of it. And here's where I can give some more clout of why I'm talking to this a bit, 
But my point of showing this slide is actually to tell the, uh, get the audience to see if they are feeling the same thing, which is this is overwhelming, but also that you don't have to be on any of these, let alone most of them. It all depends on your goal and your skill set, your time and your resources and all that. I've always been saying that. But the point of this is to say the last reason, the, only, the main reason I don't want you doing any of these in your business, what you're doing is because you're, you're, you're being felt like you've, you're, you're behind or you're old and the, and the youngins are coming. So that segue between those two sections really is supposed to, because this is the next section of what I'm doing. I usually have three sections. The open, which is either Joshi or the President Benson, which I just was talking about. And then I have the the two kind of middle sections, or but more towards the end. That middle is turning into multiple things and sections with generations, but that, that segues into my leadership stuff and that segues into the next thing else. So it comes in sections and where do the stories go versus the rant? So we have this, we walk down and again, I've been working this middle part for a while now and it goes in different directions depending on the event, the audience and the vibe of what's going on and how it's doing, how it's landing. And there's different levels of how stuff lands. So then we go into this, and so I'm, I, I shout out to my Gen Xers, and we say we're teaming up with the Boomers to form this slow and sore Voltron, and a couple of fellow geeks in the audience laugh at that. And the point is, though, I'm banding together the older people in the room and my people, my generation in the room, and we're going to go against these youngins. And the point of me showing and, and showing the bias that we have to generations in the workplace one of the ways I think is effective to show it is to reveal the bias we have without knowing it at the time. So we walk through and it's a lot of funny bits and I have to be careful with this section because I have a lot of things I can run down that is, I love doing that works really well. But again, time is limited. So you got to figure out where you go. So I do the joke that they said they invented these goggles you put on your face and I'm like now nah, we did that in the 80s and they're like yeah but smart speakers and I'm like now nah, we had that in the 80s like I keep going back and forth I did a couple of them where I used like Columbia House you know in there as well it's like we had all the music we wanted I'm like we had that in the 80s you know eight 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 cassettes for a penny and all that type of stuff but again you could do that all day and that's the problem it's not what I'm having fun with on stage it's what the audience will enjoy but also I need to get to other things that I'm talking about we could do this all all day but the point is I get them revved up. And what I'm doing here too is I'm crapping on the younger generation on stage and I have the mic. So this whole talk now for the younger people and they're like, oh, we just came in here to be crapped on. Great. And I'm going and I'm getting all my fellow oldies together. We're all doing the thing because I'm allowed to. I can do that. But then I walk through this and I'm like, so I segue back. So you notice this photo here is the same photo from, from here. And what that does is it brings the visual back to a centering point, but also allows me to know I'm about to launch into this next part because I need to center it again because there is a really huge point I'm trying to make here. And then I go, you know, because I was reading something online because I read this online and I go through this and this is four pages of text and I read it verbatim. The number one thing not to do in slides and I do it on purpose on every level and I read it and the audience can read, but I read it along anyways. And I give my own oomphs to it and pauses. And then we hit up the next one. And we're just like young people suck. And you just get out of your parents' basement and do this. And boom, ba -do -ba -do -ba 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 -da -ba -ba -da ba Now, most of the time the audience isn't reacting except for a couple of snickers or little mentions, but it's a little bit tense. And that's on purpose because what I'm trying to do is show them that there's a bias here. And that's when I show them this and I'm like, this is from Newsweek, October 31st. And here's the thing, the delay is on purpose. This is from Newsweek, October 31st, 1993. And that year when that comes in, gives us like, oh crap. Now when you flip it on the audience or fool them, you've got to be careful though too, because their time and their their emotion, everything, that, that's valuable. And you don't want to mess with that too much. But I need to mess with this as long as I'm part of the group being messed with. Like, I'm talking about me being older here, too. The whole front part of it is I'm talking about how much I hate younger people, too. My, one of my viral clips was when we say the word millennials, we mean people younger than us and we don't like you. So I get it and then I flip it. And then I show this and I'm like, hey, 
millennials, Gen Z, I got your back. Because, you know, this was not about Gen Z. This is not about millennials. This is about my people, Gen X. And then I showed a picture of me at 18, and I know it's ridiculous. And it's my Lord of the Rings edition photo. But this bit I have to work on, right? There's always the first time I put this picture up. And sometimes they realize it's, they don't know it's me. So I kind of pose like the photo for a second. Um, but then I talk about the Jocelyn stamp. So you're just addressing the obvious parts to the audience. And then I've worked, but I've been working the Jocelyn stamp bit for a while within it. And it's getting even better now. Because what I used to do with this part was for the youngins in the room, uh, this is what's known as a proof instead of a print. And a proof has a stamp on it. And a proof is a test on... Uh, um, how much your mom loves you by the number of proofs she buys. And then I just do that. And then some people start getting the joke. And then more people start getting the joke. And then people start laughing who didn't get the joke because they don't want to be left out. And then you're like, and here we go. So I have no prints of this. And then I'm like, I love my mom. And it's but actually the reason why. And they, so it's all, there's some bits in there because what happened, the wrong reasons why I'm being really self-depreciating this part too is because I'm coming really heavy at some stuff here or I'm about to. This is what I'm about to launch into really that, the sweet spot of what I'm doing, which is talking to people about really strong stuff. And what I'm trying to tell people is if your company isn't going well, then you got to look in the mirror because it's the only thing you can change. It's the only thing you can fix. It's the only thing you can adapt do anything to and so we go through this and so now here it is and i wanted to really hit home the point because i show it and they're like yeah but i'm gen x so it's like well yeah he's just talking about his generation i'm like no so i asked the audience and and so for us it's like just go out and find you know go find the quotes about generations go so you can google it right now you can find them going back to the dawn of time so then i'm like okay i want to play with it a bit more though so i'm showing this so here's another quote so i, I go like this though i say i'm going to show you another quote so I don't show it yet. But I say, I'm going to show you another quote and I want you to guess the year. And we offer to send somebody a book and blah, blah, blah. So then I'm, I get everybody ready. They're all going to guess. And I show them this. And again, this is a point to proving a point. Because people are like, they call it the 50s and the 40s. And somebody, at one of the recent events is like, the 500 BC. And it was the first time anybody ever said that because the answer is 50 BC. But you see that delaying and bringing in all the information. This slide looks terrible on its own terrible right like look at it but i'm using that negative space for a point i could have just put the quote up i could have just done it like the other things but i really want to hit this point that we've always been talking down about the younger generations and i really think that hits i really think using the wikipedia and then one of the reasons why i put that in the reference to it and the picture of cicero at least the bust of cicero is I think it, it just really hammers hold how long we've been ripping on generations. But then also I saw Cicero and I really, honestly, I'm just like, I think Cisco. And it's like the name. So I, I play with the joke and I'm like, I thought it was Cisco. And you know, I can have a little fun in there. But again, again, it's also tense. It can get tense. I'm crapping on us and how we're treating younger generations and it can get intense. So you want to break it a bit. And that's kind of the point of where you go with that. And then I'm getting into a story here. And again, this is depending on if, if, if I have the time. Because it depends on the event. If I have 45 minutes um, or 40 minutes sometimes. And my, my talks a lot are usually 45 to 60. That's usually the main thing. I love 60. Um, I can do 90. I can do like it's a, it doesn't matter the time you just tell me. But I think the hour is a suite for me. And that means because I can tell this story and this story is me working here. So I've worked the picture in, but now I'm going back to being a 17, 18 year old. And one of the reasons why with a lot of the people in the audiences want to be talking about with that generation, what's going on. So I'm bringing them back to when we were that age. That's the goal. My goal is also empathy and self-awareness. That's one of the things I talk about the trait in teams and leadership is those are huge. Well, how do you get part of that? is I go down my own experiences and stories to then say, okay, where was I not seeing things? How was I looking at people wrong? And this whole story is about the general manager at the movie theater, Brenda, who I tell the story at the start. It's like, I, you know, we hated each other and I thought it was her fault because at this age, I was at the peak of my knowledge at 18. And the moral of the story is she has my back in a, in a customer incident and she changed the way I looked at everything there. 
And then realizing that these people and the whole moral of the story is that that one individual can change your brain about work, about a company, about life, about anything. And, and then I look at the audience and say, you're that for somebody now, potentially. None of these people ever get told in the moment that that moment is changing their brain or helping them or hurting them. So you never realize in the moment you're doing that for somebody. If we can look at it that way, there's a power to your your words and your thoughts and your motivations to do things. And then I pull up Eadley's policy because it's something we saw in, in uh, along the time. Always have something, a notepad, uh, you know, an actual notepad or notes on your phone or a drive or a Dropbox or something where you can put stuff, that stories you like, you've seen that help, whether it's by industry or by story. And this was just something I had sitting on my desktop on my laptop for two years. And then I realized, well, we're getting into this point. And one of the reasons why I'm talking about standing up for your people against a aggressive or abusive customers all, is because that's one of the things that's happening even more now. And this policy really works it for me, which is the customer's not always right. Italy is not always right. And through our differences, we create harmony. Love it. And one of the things too is because it's some stuff that I'm not just saying. Some people in the audience also it helps when other people are also saying it and doing it, or other companies are doing it too, and they've taken that brand risk for doing whatever the, the thing is. And then I'm just bringing up a couple points, right? One of the things I want to float on these are the two traits that I really think going forward is what's important in leadership, but also they are the two traits that were important before. This, though, this slide has to be later in the talk and it's one of the most important slides i have the contrast is on purpose the size and the font is on purpose and i put this up and i just let it sit for five seconds but count count to that one two three four five that is an eternity to stand on stage in silence and look at an audience. And I do this on purpose because for two reasons. One, I want them to f read it and feel the impact of it for a second. But two, I have a motive. And that motive here is because I know people in the audience, there's some people in the audience there that are just like, mm, well, he doesn't know, like it, that, that's, it rubs them the wrong way. And here's the point. I don't know the people in my audience. Pretty much never met them. So if I've never met them, if I've never met you, and I don't know you, how can I be talking about you? This is not a negative statement, nor is it positive. It's just a statement. It's a statement of self-awareness. And the goal here is to get you to think a bit. That's it. But again, much later in the talk than before. Much later. And then this is the final kind of section on here for this part where it's, you're checking their pulse. Now, sometimes this is the section that gets dropped off if you're doing a 40-minute or 45-minute. Again, it depends on what they want because this goes through a lot of finding out where you stand with your people or your customers. But this is where it gets to. This is where how you find out, which is using stop, start, and continue. And that's really important. That if this part here, I, here's the thing, anything you put near the end though, too, you got to be careful because if you go on these stories or on these kind of runs with stuff and it's feeling natural and good, you're going to, you're going to cram a lot of content near the end. And what you don't want to do is go over time, respect their time. I don't care if it's five people. I don't care if you're the boss. One of the skills of doing presentations is being mindful of the audience's time. If it's a meeting from 1 to 1.30 or it's a presentation from 1 to 1.30 in a boardroom and it's five people, then you go 1 to 1.30 or 1 to 1.29. And the best give you could go is go to 1.25. you got to respect their time. So if your rants or your little runs in the middle are killing your time, you can't make it up at the end. Do not race through slides at the end saying, i got to get to the final slide. Don't leave something at the end that you have to get to. I don't have to show this slide. 
but it's an important thing I want people to know. And sometimes in my tangents and my rants in the middle, I've already said this. So when you leave near them near the back end, you may not get to them if you do my type of style of speaking. But I can still use this point. This is just a hammer at home. Every slide of yours cannot be vital. And you give yourself flexibility to go and talk more. That's why I'd like to be a little more loose with the, the scripting and the slides themselves. And then we get into, the, again, another whole section, if we have time, which is the service recovery paradox, because it's also fun because, we've, and again, relatable to the audience. This is a bad retail experience with somebody had, and we've all had that. But it's a good redemption story for the store. And what I'm trying to show people, and the point of this section is that when something goes wrong, when, you, when somebody complains, what they're looking for is validation that they've been heard because up to this point they have not. That's kind of the goal, which is the whole undercurrent for this is problems are opportunities in a non-cheesy way. And then I end with a couple funny um, things if it works. Because I like to make them laugh before I leave. And then always ending slide is always the same as my beginning slide. I was going to say it's the bookends, but it's also the, the, the bookends. <laughs> But that, instead of that blank slide, I always like coming back to the fine. Now you can put your your information here. You know, this can be your your website, your social handles, your podcast, or, or your call to action. Always, you can do that, especially if it's a selling presentation. But again, don't put your selling slide at the end, the one you need to end with, because there's an ROI factor here. And I got no problem. You got to pitch, you got to sell, if that's the context of the talk. Um, I don't, the, the keynotes I do don't do that. I don't sell from, from stage necessarily except I'm showing my books. But we make 80 cents a copy, so I'm not too concerned about selling out that way. But that's the point. We get this at the end and we have them here. So if you have a slide at the end that you really need to get to, then what I do, or you can tell a person at AV, is if you're not going to get to the rest of your slides, instead of skipping through them, because if I see you skip through them, I'm going to like, what did I miss? And if this final slide, like say this is a slide you need to get to and it's slide 30, then if you have a laptop, just put three zero enter and it'll go to slide 30. It'll go to the last slide. I'm sure there's a shortcut and you can also do it. Just go to last slide, but never don't skip through stuff and have them see it. I just want to know what I'm missing. It's like a friend of yours or your, your roommate or significant other when, I guess when we used to watch TV, I guess the channel changer and you always have somebody who went too fast. It's like somebody who's got the ox in the car and they're just skipping songs way too fast. You're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Now that I heard a second of it, now I think I, I want to kind of, you know, weigh in on it. If I see a bunch of slides going through, I'm wondering, what did I miss? Always. Anyway, that is the slides for today. I hope it was enjoyable for y'all. And um, any questions, you can always put them into here or into the recording, and I'll still see them. Happy to do these and more of these. And uh, stay safe this week. And wherever you're at, I hope you're having a an okay day. And um, here to help, drop me a line.